بالله زرت المغاني مرة Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to another episode of I Jihad, a web series dedicated to deconstructing anti-Islam polemics while providing our viewers with the most accurate information on Islam and the Muslim world. I'm your host, the narrator, and this is my sidekick, Abu Ren. Today we will be analyzing a video by a popular ex-Muslim YouTuber by the name of The Apostate Prophet. Hey Abu, can you fetch me the case file on our new target? Thanks. Let's see here. So the apostate prophet comes from a practicing Muslim family, but was rebellious and liberal throughout his youth. And after some spouts of depression, he actually thought it was a good idea to join an active communist terrorist organization. However, after some time, he decided to leave that organization and start practicing Islam. Not surprisingly, after a measly four years, he became an apostate. And as a result of all this, he's now apparently an expert on the subject. You see, much the same as previous targets of this series, the apostate prophet is regarded as an authority on Islam simply because he's an ex-Muslim. Therefore, explaining to his adulators why he's wrong is going to be a bit of an uphill battle. As you may have already noticed, I don't have the same privilege. Rather, I have to rely on valid arguments and evidence to make my case. That said, this doesn't bother me at all because academic integrity is something I aspire to. But to be frank, this episode is going to take very little effort, perhaps far less effort than any episode prior or post. And how is this the case? Well, you see, about a month ago, the apostate prophet announced on his Twitter feed that he would be releasing a video apparently showcasing the ultimate demonstration as to why the Quran is objectively wrong and Islamic scholars, apologists at all, are all trying to deceive you and eventually said video was released. However, rather than being an ultimate demonstration of how the Quran is apparently wrong or Islamic scholars, apologists at all are deceiving people, his video was the ultimate demonstration of self-refutation. In other words, the apostate prophet has literally undermined his entire channel through this video. Now, you don't have to take my word for it because I intend to prove this accusation. But before we go on, let me state the objectives of this episode. Firstly, to show that the apostate prophet cannot be trusted when it comes to his understanding of Islam. And secondly, to show that the apostate prophet is objectively wrong about most of the things he talks about. So without further ado, let's begin by examining his self-proclaimed ultimate demonstration, shall we? I want to show you how Islamic scholars, apologists, and translators of the Quran shamelessly deceive people. And this video is especially important for Muslims to watch because you will see that Islamic scholars do everything to misrepresent the Quran and corrupt the Quran, which they consider Allah's word, just to keep Islam from being wrong. If you're a Muslim, at the end of this video, your trust in both Islamic scholars and your holy book should be heavily shaken. In my former video, I took a Quran verse, chapter 10, verse 5, and pointed out that the Quran calls the moon a light, when in reality, the moon is neither light nor does it emit light. It reflects light coming from the sun. The reason the Quran uses shining light for the sun and nur, light, for the moon is obvious. The sun looks like this and the moon looks like this. Let's look at regular, old, classic translations of this verse. As you can see, the classic translations accurately translate that part of this verse, in which the sun is a shining light, a shining object, and the moon is a light. 
These translations are still honest, because back then we didn't care much about reality and science, and there weren't many critics of Islam who pointed out flaws in the Quran. But now let's come to a more modern translation. It is the first English Quran translation that you find when you Google Quran or when you search for a Quran verse. Sahih International, currently the most widespread Quran translation online. It is he who made the sun a shining light and the moon a derived light and determined for it faces. Whoa, do you see that? It says derived light or a reflected light. Although it doesn't say such a thing in the original verse, it just says nur, and the word nur means simply light. In the Arabic text, it only calls the moon a light. The same thing can even be found in another verse, chapter 71, verse 16. Again, the Quran calls the moon a light, but the Sahih International translation adds its own words to the verse and calls it a reflected light or a derived light. Adding words in order to make the Quran look correct is a corruption. And Islamic apologists and scholars who create these corruptions are liars. This is how they want to defend Islam with deceptions. This is how they want to deceive Muslim believers. And this shows how fragile and how outdated and a human product Islam is. The Apostate Prophet's entire video essentially argues that because some scholars, apologists, and translators infer certain meanings from words in the Qur'an, specifically regarding the light of the moon, this implies they're all deceiving you and Islam is suspect as a result. Therefore, you should only trust the Apostate Prophet. How convenient. Now, there's obviously a little more to this video, content which I'll address at a later point, but this is the gist of his argument. However, there are some major problems with his claims. You see, there are a number of logical fallacies he's committed throughout his video. Among them is the idea that because one translation, i.e. Sahih International, appears erroneous, this therefore proves that Islamic scholarship in general cannot be trusted. But this is nonsensical and is known as the fallacy of hasty generalization, or a fallacy of jumping to conclusions where the key error is to overestimate the strength of an argument based on too small a sample for the implied confidence level or error margin. And yet another fallacy he's committed in conjunction to this is that such an erroneous translation proves that Islam is somehow false, or in his words, fragile, outdated, and man-made. But this is also absurd, and is merely an example of a non sequitur. You see, there is no necessary connection between the integrity of an individual and the validity of their beliefs. Just because someone fails to explain an idea correctly does not mean said idea is false. All it tells us is that the person or persons in question are either bad at explaining things, may lack sufficient knowledge of what they're promoting, or simply lack integrity. That's it. But let's assume for the sake of argument that the apostate prophet hasn't committed any fallacies. Let's assume for a moment that his argument is both valid and sound. If we buy into his reasoning, we must therefore also come to another conclusion, that the apostate prophet himself cannot be trusted and all his claims are objectively wrong. How so? Well, take for example one of his previous videos on the nature of jihad. Let's talk about the meaning first. The term jihad comes from the word for struggle or effort. That means that people who claim it's just struggle are not entirely wrong. The word is indeed struggle and effort, but that's not all. Of course, you can just take the literal meaning of the word jihad and, re and reject any kind of factual criticism of the concept of Islamic holy war, but that would be ugly and dishonest. The term stands for much more than what a totally stupid campaign once claimed it does. The word jihad is used in the Quran 34 times in different forms in 30 verses and is used almost in all cases in terms of physically fighting for Allah or helping the cause of Allah with their wealth. In some verses, the word is a generalization of jihad, which can mean fighting or proselytizing. In some cases, in the minority of cases, it is just about being faithful and patient. If we look at some examples where the word is used, we can pick the following. Not equal are those believers remaining at home other than the disabled and the mujahideen who strive and fight in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Allah has preferred the mujahideen, those who uh, make jihad, through their wealth and their lives over those who remain behind by degrees. And to both, Allah has promised the best reward, but Allah has preferred the mujahideen over those who remain behind with a great reward. 
This is chapter 4, verse 95. Another example, chapter 61, verse 11, is it is that you believe in Allah and his messenger and strive in the cause of Allah with, a, with your wealth and your lives. That is best for you if you should know. Another example of jihad in the sense of fighting is, O Prophet, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them, and their refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. And a final example is, the ones who have believed, emigrated and striven in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives, are greater in rank in the sight of Allah, and it is those who are the attainers of success. All these verses that I just took as an example, are examples where the word jihad is literally used for fighting in the cause of Allah. So the word jihad is used in the Quran, in the most important book, the source of Islam as fighting in the way of Allah. And yet we have moderate Muslims and self-loathing people in the West who want to tell us a different narrative. Even though the scholarly consensus in Islam is very clear, jihad is fighting in the way of Allah. Notice anything odd here? Well, it should first be noted that the translation he's using for this video is Sahih International, the very same translation he's now accusing of deception. And secondly, although he rightly claims that the literal meaning of the word jihad is to struggle or strive, he makes a startling admission that anyone who does not infer beyond the literal meaning of the term is being dishonest. To bolster his accusation, he goes on to show a number of verses from the Quran. For instance, in the very first verse he mentions, he accepts the translator's inclusion of the word fight in brackets, despite the literal Arabic word for fight, or qatl, being nowhere present in the text. In the subsequent verse he shows, the word jihad is used in its literal form, but once again the apostate prophet assumes it's about fighting despite the literal Arabic word for fight being absent. And in the next verse he does something even more curious. He accepts the translator's use of the English word fight, despite the fact that the actual Arabic term here is jahidi. And in the final verse he references, yet another variation of the word jihad is used but not qatl. And for those of you out there who want a comparison, there are actually several places in the Quran where the literal word for fight is used. For example, Surah 2 verse 190. And why is this all a problem? Well, because the apostate prophet is operating off double standards. You see, when it suits his agenda, he's perfectly fine with translators inferring more than one meaning for a term. However, when it does not suit his agenda, he goes on to condemn those exact same translators as being deceptive. Now, some apologists even try to argue that the word nur, which is used here, could mean reflected light, or also means reflected light, or receiving light. But that's complete nonsense. Every dictionary will tell you, nur means light. That is also evident in Quran chapter 33 verse 46, where the Quran calls Muhammad an illuminating lamp, or a lamp that spreads light. Siraj means lamp, and light means nur. Did the Quran make a linguistic mistake here? The hypocrisy is palpable. Now, to be fair, I think it's perfectly fine to infer more than one meaning from a word, especially if it's a general term. So I have no problem with someone translating the word jihad as fight when the context demands it. Likewise, I have no problem with the word nur or light, including different forms of light under its definition, because light is a general term that can include all forms of light. But remember, according to the apostate prophet, abiding by such a common sense understanding of language means you're being dishonest and your beliefs are suspect as a result. In summary, the apostate prophet has effectively demonstrated by his own reasoning that he himself cannot be trusted and all his claims are invalid. Now, I want to reiterate that I don't find the apostate prophet's reasoning convincing. I just find it amusing how easy it was for me to completely destroy his credibility in just a few minutes. You see, the fact of the matter is, the apostate prophet is desperate to undermine Islamic scholars and academics through any means necessary. And why? Well, because he realizes that most scholars and academics disagree with his nonsensical views and he wants to bolster his image as an authority to his gullible audience. An audience that has yet to realize that the apostate prophet is simply cherry-picking the very scholars he claims you don't need in order to study Islam. 
But he does say something in another tweet that I happen to agree with. Islam requires a great deal of time and effort to study properly, but what it also requires is a great deal of integrity and a proper research methodology. Qualities which scholars of Islam and academics like myself are formally taught and obligated to uphold. Qualities which the apostate prophet clearly lacks. So yes, while it is certainly true that Islam isn't rocket science, this doesn't mean that people with degrees in the subject are somehow irrelevant. Clearly, we're still needed, because obviously self-proclaimed rational and intelligent individuals are far too stupid to realize their own blatant inconsistencies. But let's take a look at another claim in his video, that the Qur'an is supposedly scientifically inaccurate because it describes the moon as a light. Here, the apostate prophet further showcases his hypocrisy. It is he who made the sun a shining light, and the moon a light, and determined for it faces, that you may know the number of years and account of time. Allah has not created this except in truth. He details the signs for a people who know. Chapter 10 verse 5 The original Arabic text simply says that Allah made the sun a lamp, a shining light. No objection to that although the Quran never reveals the true nature of the sun. But then it calls the moon a nur. Nur means simply light. So here, the apostate prophet has a problem with the Quran describing the moon as a light. However, he has absolutely no problem with the sun being described as a lamp or a shining light. But according to his own methodology, he should have a problem with the sun being described as a lamp or a shining light. Why? Because the sun is not a lamp or a shining light. Rather, it is a star that emits light. It is not a man-made object that holds a source of light, nor is it composed of electromagnetic waves. Rather, it is a natural object made of plasma. Therefore, according to the apostate prophet's own reasoning, he too is scientifically illiterate. That said, I don't actually believe the apostate prophet is scientifically illiterate. Rather, I think the reason he agreed with the sun being described as a lamp or a shining light is because he understands the use of figurative language. However, because he lacks basic critical thinking skills, he did not attempt to apply that understanding consistently, choosing instead to read the first half of this passage like any normal person would, while reading the latter half like someone suffering from severe autism. But a question remains. Why does the Qur'an describe the sun as a lamp and a shining light, but the moon as just a light? Well, the answer is quite simple. Because that's how they appear in the sky. Thus, there is no reason to suggest that this passage is meant to convey a scientific understanding of these two objects. Anyone who suggests otherwise, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, is committing a serious error. And yes, I'm even calling out Zakir Naik here. For more information as to how the Qur'an should be read, please refer to my lecture titled Science and the Qur'an, A Forced Marriage. In conclusion, if this is the apostate prophet's ultimate demonstration, i.e. his best possible attempt at criticizing Islam, then there is little else I can say but this. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Prior to ending this episode, I'd like to give a closing analysis. Undoubtedly, the apostate prophet and his followers are going to take offense to my video and the tone I've used throughout. In fact, he has on numerous occasions shown his sensitivity to insult, often inferring that Muslims simply don't like him because he's an apostate who criticizes Islam. But I assure my viewers that the reason I'm dealing with him in this manner has nothing to do with his poor attempts at criticism, nor with him being an apostate. 
Quite the contrary, I'm happy he's criticizing Islam, because it gives me additional material to use to strengthen the faith of my audience. Likewise, I am absolutely relieved that he's left Islam. And why? Well, frankly, because we already have enough idiots trying to represent our religion. So the fewer, the better. Well, uh, I would say like this. Um, I grew up in a, into a religious Muslim family, but... Um, in, in my childhood, in my teenage years, I was very much, I wasn't very receptive to my parents teaching me about the religion and, uh, trying to, trying to make me pray and things like that. I, I was always rebellious against it. I, I always had a, had kind of a, uh, an independent mind. So I, I was never really into that. But, uh, we moved to Turkey when I was, uh, 16 years old. I went through major depression when I was in Turkey. Uh, I found myself identifying with things like uh, communism. I was very, uh, f for quite a long time in my... So, so for some time I was a communist and I, I really went very far because I, I had major issues, major depressions with going back to Turkey and so on. And I found myself su openly supporting, even at school, this uh, illegal um, city... How is it called? Illegal guerrilla organizations, illegal terrorist uh, communist organization, revolutionary organization. I was in an identity crisis. At first, I met nationalism, Turkish nationalism, and rejected it as soon as I understood it and saw how nationalists in Turkey are. After a while, I became interested in communism and the idea of revolution and independence, fighting global imperialism. And I was actually part of that and joined a youth organization of an illegal terrorist organization in Turkey. But after studying communism thoroughly for two years, I thought it's unrealistic and nonsense. So apparently the apostate prophet only left the terrorist organization because he finally realized Marx's labor theory of value was nonsense. Not because, you know, targeting and killing innocent people is wrong or anything. I mean, given his past affiliations with terrorist organizations prior to him practicing Islam, it's probably for the best that he left the religion when he did, considering the strong possibility that he would have eventually joined another one. That said, the reason I'm being so harsh with the apostate prophet is the same reason that I've been harsh with others in the past. Because he's an obnoxious and contemptible individual. You see, throughout his videos he loves to insult Muslims and generally considers us all a bunch of savages. For example, his perspective on converts to Islam is nothing less than disparaging. So when you convert to Islam, you are actually degrading yourself and you are going back. If the word revert refers to being backwards in human progress, then I think the word revert is completely accurate. Apparently, all reverts are backwards and degrading themselves. Really? Well, as a revert and a self-identified fundamentalist myself, I don't happen to recall ever supporting terrorist organizations before or after my conversion and I've been a Muslim for 10 years, far longer than the apostate prophet has practiced. And even at the most depressing moments of my life, I never entertained the idea that terrorism was morally justifiable. Likewise, I have never met any other reverts or conservative Muslims who had these sentiments. Rather, I and many others have spent a great deal of time and effort risking our lives to fight against terrorism and extremism in the Muslim world. I personally have worked under policy institutes and a foreign government to help combat ISIS within its borders, and I know many Muslims better than myself who are actively engaged in military jihad against terrorists as we speak. Yet, this random idiot on YouTube who only practiced his religion for a measly four years, who literally joined a terrorist organization and now allies himself with a diagnosed psychopath and a discredited conspiracy theorist, has the audacity to claim that people like myself are backwards? Seriously? I am so utterly disgusted by this person that I wouldn't even allow him the privilege to clean my shoes. So let me end with a personal message to the apostate prophet himself. Reality check. You are irrelevant, and your YouTube channel does not help a single person in any significant way. No policy institute, no government agency, nor any academic is calling you up asking for your advice or quoting your amateur videos in their research papers. You have literally done nothing to make the world a better place. I mean, you can't even muster up enough talent or willpower to take care of yourself. 
believing a mere toothache is equivalent to death. Honestly, the only thing you've ever positively contributed in your entire existence can be found in the very video you're watching at this very moment. And with all that said, I'd like to thank my viewers for watching. Until next time, Jazakallah khaira, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.